Good morning. It's Monday, the 5th of February, and this is Govind Rajethi Raj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes of the day. Foreign investors are stepping up in India's debt markets. Is the Reserve Bank of India, India's banking regulator, unfair? Oil prices crash even as Indian oil giants step up investments. Can India grow without private capital expenditure? Meta or Facebook is Wall Street's new comeback kid. This is a core report with Govindraj Atiraj. Foreign investors are stepping up on debt. Well, first, the stock markets, which were mostly undecided on the day of the interim budget 2024, which was Thursday last week. But they did make up their mind on Friday, the last day of trading last week, zooming up over 1,400 points and then scaling back sharply to end at about 440 points at 72,086. The broader Nifty 50, meanwhile, closed at 21,854, up 156 points. Some other data points are not looking so encouraging. Foreign portfolio investors have sold more than $3.1 billion worth of shares in the last month, the most in a year. Now, one reason for that could be valuations in India, which are considered high by most. And the other, of course, is rising bond yields in the United States, which make it attractive for money to stay there, then travel so far. But then in 2023, global investors had bought almost $21 billion of Indian stocks on a net basis, which in turn was the largest total in three years. Now, 40% of those foreign inflows actually came in during the last two months of the year. That's November and December, which I'm sure, as you know, were phenomenal months for the stock markets. On the other hand, investors have been consistently moving money out of China for a while now, but there could be some rethink as China is making a series of attempts to boost its markets, including through launching a stabilization fund. Now, on the other hand, debt, as some had predicted, is running away, including for the same foreign institutional investors who've invested over $2.4 billion or about 20,000 crores in the country's debt market in January, the same month, making it the highest monthly inflow in more than six years. JP Morgan Chase had in September announced that it would add Indian government bonds to its benchmark emerging market index from June 2024. And this inclusion is expected to benefit India by attracting some 20 to $40 billion in the next 18 to 24 months. And as we spoke on Friday, the Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman's statement that she would reduce fiscal deficit to 5.1% of GDP for 24-25 is also seen as positive for the debt market going forward. Now, on Wall Street, companies are surprising on the upside with fourth quarter profits much better than what most expected. CNBC reports that easing input costs, more emphasis on cost controls and efficiencies, and of course, significantly reduced expectations have helped. Now, let's look at a few key sectors. This is on Wall Street. 90% of energy companies have beat earnings estimates with profits coming in almost 14% above expectations. In healthcare, 85% of them have beat expectations, while earnings are coming in at about 11% above expectations. And tech, 84% have posted earnings beats with earnings more than 5% above expectations. Within tech, we'll come to Meta's blowout earnings later in the show. Will private sector start capital investment this year? Now, one question that comes up in most forward strategy discussions on Indian companies nowadays is whether the capital expenditure cycle will resume. So what that means is, let's say for a steel or a cement or even a consumer product company to expand its production capacity or its manufacturing lines. So on one hand, analysts say that Indian companies are reaching closer to now peak capacity around the time they should start investing again. While this is happening or beginning to happen in some sectors, The pace on a much more broader sense is not as noteworthy as perhaps would be desired. Interestingly, TV Somanathan, Finance Secretary to the Government of India, told Money Control that with or without private capital expenditure, India has enough firepower to sustain the rate of growth at current levels. The way he says it is that growth will continue, which I'm guessing is around 7.3%, the figure the government has put out. Now, according to him, without the private sector coming forward, we have achieved the growth rate we have achieved And we will continue to spend more next year than we spent this year. 
So the government has allocated about 11.1 lakh crore rupees as capital expenditure for the next fiscal year, a roughly 11% increase from the current year's budget estimate and almost 17% higher than the revised estimate. Now, read one way, obviously this means the government is confident of growth because of the money that it is pumping into the system, mostly infrastructure. But read another way, it also suggests it is not confident the private sector will kick in or at least as majorly as it should or ought to or is expected to, which is in 24-25. Now, government spending obviously is a good sign because we can see where it's going in terms of robust infrastructure, but government investing alone is not a great place to be in either. So maybe the private sector will step up investments this year or maybe it will go a little slow. But what is the largest strategic direction that the government is and has indicated in its interim budget? I'm joined now by Shankar Ayer, well-known economic journalist and columnist with New Indian Express, who also wrote on the interim budget in his weekly column. And I begin rather by asking him, what were the directional cues that he took away from the interim budget? So there is a clear recognition in the government that investment-led growth, which we've had, we've had 7 plus percent growth and large part of it is government's investment, that has its limitations. If you want broader economic prosperity, broader employment growth. So the reason that private final consumption is not picking up, if the bottom two quintiles clearly visible in sales figures of FMCG and durables and two-wheelers and frontline products, also visible is this sort of delayed and sort of pragmatic investment by the private sector. So the reason there is the cost of capital, and that cost of capital is driven by the cost, the high level of borrowings of the government. So the budget arrived at an intersection of aspiration and compulsion. The compulsion is to drive economic growth through consumption, you know, sort of scaffold the investment-led growth with consumption so that the private sector will come and invest. Now, this they have patched up with an aspiration for better ratings, more global investment, and we are already on the JP Morgan Index. I think India will be on the Bloomberg sooner than later. So they have patched these two together. So the 5.1% fiscal deficit is achievable. It's a little tough, but it's achievable. It gives the broad signal to the global investors that here is Atmanir Bharat or Resilient India. Come and invest. Right. If you were to now look at, let's say, the same question in a more socio-economic sense. So this is the economic part of the argument. In a more socio-economic sense, is this giving us any hints on what the next few years are likely to be in terms of will the government be like, you know, a benevolent, you know, big brother or big sister or will it be, you know, more laissez-faire and let the market run its course or due? How are you seeing it in a very broader sense? See, the political economy sort of rests on the politics of the day. And in the absence of greater push for investment, greater creation of capacity for steel, cement, steel, refinery, new plants. So the only investments that you see, large investments, are in the zones where infrastructure is happening. So additional capacity, incremental capacity is being created. And the other is the PLI schemes where manufacturing plants are sort of you know, the apples and others. The government has no option but to lead the investment brigade. If the private sector is hesitant, is incapable, or the cost is too much, or they don't see a blind path. So the government will have to go on investing. And that means the government will have to go keep borrowing. And so that's a challenge that is an opportunity also. And this I've said that We've had an asset monetization scheme in place for the last four years or so. So it got disrupted by the pandemic and other things. But I think this is something that they should take up in earnest. Between 2004 and 2024, some 30 companies, public sector units were listed. You know, if the government sort of offloads some more shares in that, brings down its own shareholding, they could raise around four or five lakh crores. And so the government has to do the thing that needs to be done. And that is to trim deficit, trim trim its debt. It's one thing to say that I'm bringing down fiscal deficit, I'm very admirable, 
ambitious target, but how do you go on? What's the glide right path for the next year to reach 4525? Right. And, you know, at this point, even thinking, for example, of let's say taxes going up. I mean, our, this government reduced taxes a few years ago, corporate taxes, when actually it was not really expected. Maybe some people knew it was coming, but it was not really expected in the broader sense. Personal taxes are stable at this point. Do you think anything could happen on that account or that accord? So there is a question mark over whether that tax which was cut in 2018, 2019 will continue. And the arguments are there on both sides. Yes, it should continue and people want long-term visibility, predictability, all of that stuff. The other argument within the government is that PLIs are serving the purpose much better. And so if the tax is not renewed. So mind you, finance minister renewed two of those sunrise laws but there was no mention of it. Maybe it's because it's the interim budget. But I suspect it's on the hook now and it will depend on whether how the economy behaves. The second part is that if we are going to be in the game of reassuring and friend shoring of China plus one and all those policies, then we need to have more competitive fiscal deficit, more competitive debt level, more competitive tax regime. And of course, much better on the ground regulation. We still have Inspector Raj. We must have we may have done away with license Raj, but we have Inspector Raj. So many of forms and stuff that goes on in the running of an enterprise. It's still difficult to start an enterprise and that's still one of the questions. So if they want investments, they need to do these things. But on a social level, they also need to invest much more in human capital. We've been talking about a 6% investment in education, I think, for much of my life. Uh, Kotari Commission was soon after I was born. So we still don't have 6% in education. We need to spend much more in health. And we need to find ways to keep what, you know, cooperative societies call sinking fund for the transition to a new greener, energy system. So I don't know. I mean, you know, unless the government sort of gets a fix on these things, these are going to be the question marks. Right. And last question, so which is an extension of this, is that it was clear that the interim budget had no freebies or even hints of that. And that comes from that political capital that the government clearly believes it has. So do you see that extending now into the coming years, assuming this government were to come back into power? I mean, that stance Nothing is off the table good. In politics, till the last ball is bold, everything is on the table. Any promise can be made. You remember, they were not in favor of loan waivers, but they did loan waivers. They were not in favor of CVs, but they transferred money. They were not in favor of... I mean, the political parties are in the business of winning elections. So whatever needs to be done, will be done. And... Why give away the promises in the interim budget? Remember, the Prime Minister is crowdsourcing what should be there on the manifesto. It's yet to come through. You don't know what's in that. Right, Shankar, thank you so much for joining me. Does the Reserve Bank know what it's doing? In December 2020, The Reserve Bank of India asked HDFC Bank to stop all launches of its upcoming digital business generating activities and sourcing of new credit card customers after repeated outages at its data center which impacted operations. The announcement sent a minor shockwave of sorts in the financial markets and amongst banks for sure, even though some would have been rejoicing. One, that the RBI would do something like this to HDFC Bank, whose pedigree is obviously strong. And second, punishing it for something which may have well been beyond its control. Now, I don't recall people signing petitions in support of HDFC Bank or leading protest marches to the Reserve Bank of India's headquarters in Ballad Estate, Mumbai. Now, let's go back. The Reserve Bank of India lifted those restrictions, partly for credit cards in August 2021 itself and in March 2022 for those digital lead generation. HDFC Bank said at that point that it would continue to serve its customers with dedication and humility. Earlier in June 2019, the Reserve Bank of India slapped a 1 crore rupee fine on HDFC Bank for non-compliance on KYC and anti-money laundering norms and identified deficiencies in regulatory compliance. Once again, while the fine was minor, the fact that the Reserve Bank cracked down at all was interesting. 
Also, this was based on a reference from customs authorities regarding submissions of forged bill of entities by some importers to the bank for remitting foreign currency. So effectively, HDFC Bank was punished for being conned. In April 2021, the Reserve Bank of India stopped American Express Banking Corporation from onboarding new domestic customers for its credit cards. And the reason American Express was punished was because apparently it violated its circular on storage of payments data. And that circular was issued in 2018. Now, that ban did not affect the existing customer base of Amex either. Now, Amex sounded like it was hurt by the move, saying that they were in regular dialogue with the Reserve Bank of India about data localization requirements and had demonstrated their progress towards complying with the regulation. Restrictions were lifted after almost 16 months. And finally, in November 2023, which is, as you know, only two months ago, the Reserve Bank of India ordered Bajaj Finance, also one of the hottest newer finance stocks, to stop issuing new loans through its e-com and Insta EMI card due to non-compliance with digital lending guidelines. The Reserve Bank of India said it found non-issuance of key fact statements to the borrowers under these two lending products. Key fact statements, or KFS, is a concise document that outlines the essential terms and conditions of a financial product, such as a loan or credit facility, and includes information on interest rates, fees, repayment terms, and other critical details. It was introduced last year as part of digital lending guidelines to drive transparency in consumer lending. Now, maybe some folks at Bajaj Finance decided people don't read this either way, or for some other reason it was ignored or not sufficient attention was paid to it. And it's quite likely that the more paperwork you load on a customer at that crucial moment in a Chroma or Vijay sales, when he or she is buying a 48-inch TV, then quite likely they will start looking around the showroom for other options or, worse, give up on that purchase altogether. Anyway, Bajaj Finance's stock fell about 5% after this move, which was evidently part of a larger crackdown on small loans, which the Reserve Bank clearly found to be running away. Now, around that time later, actually, the Reserve Bank even increased wages for banks, non-bank finance companies and credit cards for these small loans, anticipating rising defaults. Now, the word anticipation is important and stay with me on that. It is not my case that the Reserve Bank's moves are all perfectly thought through and can survive the scrutiny of all the VC-funded genius logic that usually pervades the financial system under, of course, the guise of the march of technology. Yes, I am saying that the Reserve Bank of India could be behind the curve. But let's take another example, bitcoins and virtual currencies. Do you know since when the Reserve Bank of India has been formally and officially cautioning the system, which is the Indian financial system? Well, the answer is since December 2013, that's 11 years ago, at least being the official releases I could find. So when did the implosions in Bitcoin start? Well, in the last two years, beginning with the collapse of FTX in November 2022 and the crypto exchange Binance, which faced fraud charges in the middle of last year. The point is that all this time, people were sniggering at the Reserve Bank of India and by extension, the government of India for being behind the curve and for being a bunch of fuddy-duddy oldies who are just not getting it. Well, thank your stars that they were and they're not. The Reserve Bank of India's Governor Shakti Kanta Das, as recently as two weeks ago, said in Davos, he did not care if other countries went ahead with Bitcoin exchange-traded funds and the like, referring, of course, to the US Securities and Exchange Commission. He said, and this is in Davos just two weeks ago, that so far as India is concerned, we see a lot of risks and it is not necessary for us that whatever somebody else does, we simply adopt. Now, without getting into a fairly pointless merit-based discussion on Paytm and its shenanigans for which the markets are already inflicting punishment, let me add a few points. The Reserve Bank of India can be behind the curve, once again, when it comes to the march of technology. But evidence suggests that this is not mostly the case, and I'm talking about the technology part. In the case of crypto, for example, if anything, it's been ahead of the curve in warning the system. Now, on those specific cases, I quoted three instances from HDFC Bank, Bajaj Finance and American Express cards where the Reserve Bank has cracked down for quite different reasons, but there is a technology element that links all of them. Now, the Reserve Bank of India, like any mature regulator, acts with a reasonable degree of precision. It does not shut down the whole organization. It takes care to see ordinary depositors are not hurt, which, by the way, is its key responsibility. And finally, it sends home a message that it's watching carefully. The punishments seem somewhat balanced and at least going by the examples quoted here, don't seem to care about the pedigree or experience or legacy of the companies in question, particularly of the founders or promoters. Now, you could argue that there are other cases where the Reserve Bank of India has looked the other way because of some pressure, like political, like the big bank NPA loan problem we've faced a decade ago, but we've got over now. But that was more individual banks and the Reserve Bank of India could be faulted for not tightening the screws earlier. 
And either way, it had not much to do with the march of technology, which is the question or the point here. But most importantly, I've always got the feeling that the Reserve Bank has acted or it tries to act in anticipation to try and prevent a bigger problem from happening rather than solving the one it may have just discovered. So apply that to Paytm too. And finally, India does have mature economic regulators and financial systems amongst the best in the world. And all my experience tells me that for all the faults they surely have, I would trust most of their actions. Of course, I would question them as well. Incidentally, the one action of the Reserve Bank of India I have questioned, and I'm pretty sure it's in public domain somewhere, either in a column or a post, is the creation of the payment wallet. Because I've always found it a bypass that we should have found another workaround or solution or not got into. India's energy giants step up on investments as oil prices fall. And here is our energy segment brought to you by India Energy Week starting later this week. That's on the 6th of February. ONGC, Indian Oil Corporation and other oil public sector units will invest about 120,000 crores in the coming fiscal or that's 24-25 in oil and gas exploration, refineries, petrochemicals and laying pipelines, the PTI has reported. The figure has been gleaned from the budget 24-25 documents and suggests it's about 5% higher than the amount being spent in the current fiscal year, that's 23-24. ONGC has planned capital spending of about 31,000 crores, including for new reserves of oil and gas, bringing to production discoveries it's already made, and in developing discoveries in both the east and west coasts of the country. Indian Oil, the country's largest refiner, will be the top spender with an investment outlay of about 31,000 crore focusing on expansion and upgrading its seven refineries that produce fuel. Bharat Petroleum has proposed a 30% higher capital spending at about 13,000 crores, two-thirds of which will be in its core refining business. HPCL or Hindustan Petroleum will invest about 12,500 crore, a little higher than last year. And Oil India Limited, the country's second largest oil producer, will invest about 7,000 crores as compared to about 6,000 in the current fiscal. Elsewhere, oil prices have fallen as talks to pause the Israel-Hamas war gave comfort to the markets and suggested a reduced geopolitical risk premium. Brent crude has fallen to about $77.33 a barrel, which is quite a fall if you take the events of the last few days, including the United States bombing parts of Iraq and Syria in retaliation for an attack in Jordan which killed US soldiers. West Texas Intermediate fell about 2% to settle around $72 a barrel. Futures are down 7.3% since last Friday, the biggest weekly tumble since early October, according to Bloomberg. Meanwhile, broadly, supply seems strong, even as demand seems weak. This was part of our energy segment, supported by India Energy Week, to be held from February 6th in Goa. For more details, do log on to www.indiaenergyweek.com. Which clean car technology is India supporting? Well, speaking about oil and fuels and energy, the answer to that question apparently is a little ambiguous going by a statement from a Tata Motors senior official on Friday. Reuters reported that officials saying that India needs to make clear which clean car technology it intends to support to meet its zero emission goals. His point, automakers can't invest in all technologies. And this obviously shows up and throws up an interesting point or perhaps conundrum. Now, his comment apparently came in response to a question seeking Tata Motors' position if the government were to lower import taxes on hybrid cars. Now, did you know, by the way, that India taxes electric vehicles at just 5%, hybrids at 43%, which is, of course, just below the 48% imposed on petrol cars? Now, there is pressure on the government from the Japanese car makers to reduce taxes on hybrids, which Toyota and Maruti are making now, and by the way, are also flying off the dealerships even before they hit them. Presumably, all the car makers, including the Japanese ones, don't want Tesla charging into India without first investing in a local manufacturing plant either, as they have all done. Wall Street's top comeback kid. Bloomberg is reporting that Meta Platforms just became Wall Street's top comeback kid. It was only a couple of years ago that the Facebook owner suffered the single biggest market value destruction in stock market history. And now Meta's stock rose 20% on Friday to close at an all-time high of about $475 per share, adding $197 billion to its market capitalization, the biggest single-session market value addition, eclipsing According to Bloomberg, the $190 billion gains made by Apple and Amazon in 2022. 
An analyst told Bloomberg that Meta's AI, that's artificial intelligence pipeline for both users and advertisers, is robust with more tools set to launch and scale throughout 2024. Meta, which also reduced headcount by 22% last year, unveiled plans for a $50 billion stock buyback and announced its first quarterly dividend on Thursday, a sign to investors that it has money to spare and a reason for them to stick around with the company, or into Bloomberg. Meta has also seemingly dumped its Metaverse plans and focused on AI to improve ad targeting and its social platforms, all of which seems to be delivering results going by the market's response. That's it for me for today. Have a great Monday and the rest of the week. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>